Salutations, everyone, and welcome to the second edition of Hall Pro. I'm joined by my amazing panel of Brian Henderson and Bobby Steiner. Now, we have a lot of sports happenings to talk about, but first, I want to ask you guys how you're doing today. Man, you know, I'm doing good. Happy to be here. First time on Hall Pro. Excited to make my debut. And yeah, a lot of stuff to talk about. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm fine. I can't complain. I'm looking forward to my debut as well. And I'm excited to talk sports with some of my boys. Yes, of course. We love to hear that we have two debuts, which I was unaware of. But that does make sense as we have brought this show back this year. It's season two, better than ever. I cannot wait. So let's get right into it without further ado. First, we're going to talk about the NBA. Now, the dust has settled on the 2022 NBA season. The Golden State Warriors have indeed defeated the Boston Celtics in six games. Uh, It was their fourth title in six years. Steph, Clay, and Draymond all receive their fourth ring. So first, let me just get your thoughts initially on the series. Bobby, I'll start with you. All right. So my thoughts, I had the same thought going into it as I have now the dust has settled. The Warriors were just simply the better team than the Celtics. Of course, that is not taking anything away from the Celtics. Their road to the finals and the way they played was very impressive, definitely. I mean, both Jays averaged over 20 and taking a team like the Warriors to six. I'm very happy that Curry finally got his finals MVP. I mean, with 31.2 points per game, that is quite impressive. Seeing Clay come back from injury and do what he did was awesome to see, too. And I mean, Jordan Poole and Andrew Wiggins, I mean, they played their socks off, man. It was crazy to see. As a as a Celtics fan, I could rant for about like twenty minutes about the whole thing, but I'm not. Um, overall, this so the Celtics obviously they lost in six. This series, at least as a fan, felt a lot like when the uh, Celtics lost to the Heat in six in the um, uh, Eastern Conference Finals back in the bubble. It was six games, but it did not feel like a competitive six games. But I mean, yeah, like like you said, Bobby, the Warriors they were just they were undoubtedly the better team. I don't. Uh, Curry is one of those people where I don't think there is a way to guard him. Like I don't, like the shot that he can make, it doesn't it, it, it doesn't matter. It just it's completely draining to watch him. I like, when when he's competing against your team, but I knew the, I knew Wiggins was going to be a huge piece for the Warriors going into this matchup. I didn't realize how good he was going to be against the Celtics, and I feel like if Curry didn't average thirty, he could have made a serious case for being Finals MVP. He was a huge rebounder, which I didn't expect. Admittedly, I thought he was going to be maybe more of a scorer, but you know the Warriors undoubtedly the better team, and I mean they if they weren't a, if they weren't a dynasty yet, they absolutely are now. Yeah, I agree with that, Brian. I definitely think the Warriors are a dynasty. I mean, they've won four championships in the last six years. A very impressive feat from the entire Warriors team, um, and Steve Kerr really heading the charge, leading that team being able to coach them up year in and year out and seemingly they're they're uh, competing for the title every single year. But overall, I was happy with the series. I thought it was a very entertaining series. Um, it looked like Boston might be able to run away with it early. And then, of course, the Warriors fought back towards the end of the series in the later games, and they did end up winning. Now, um, as we mentioned, the Warriors do have a dynasty. I think that is uh, concrete set in stone now for sure. Um, I do have a couple more notes, though, that I want to touch on. Draymond Green just being an absolute menace to society was kind of funny, I'm not going to lie. Um, he had, at one point he had 17 fouls and 17 points, uh, which is obviously not ideal for helping your team win a, a NBA championship. But regardless, um, he, he, he definitely could have stepped up and done a little bit better. But, uh, I will say from a neutral standpoint, it was kind of funny to see him just kind of, you know, being physical, trying to play the, the brand of basketball that Celtics play on the Warriors. Because when you look at the Warriors, they're really like a finesse team. You know, they shoot a lot of threes. They they score in transition. They don't really, you know, get physical in the paint and, and really work for their points. They kind of, they move the ball. I mean, they do work for the points, but can be wrong. But not not in the way that Celtics do. So it was a bit funny to see Draymond, you know, try to make up for that on his own and play offensive linemen every single game and just run into picks and whatnot, whatever he was doing. Um but that is, that's just uh, something that I noticed. And also something else I want to talk about, too, is how I think the Celtics very well could be back here. I think that this team is very young. They're very talented, led by Jason Tatum. He has so much potential. Um, a lot of people were roasting him on social media, but I think it was very unwarranted um, because – I, uh, underneath all that, he's a very good player. He works extremely, extremely hard. He doesn't just do that for social media clout. So I very well think we could see Jason Tatum lead this team back uh, to the finals again next year, the next few years. I would be on the lookout, and I'm sure Brian's loving this right now, being a Celtics yeah, fan. Yeah, no, if I if I can touch on that real quick as a, yeah. as a Celtics fan, so I mean, I I, I am going to disagree with you about the you know, the Jason Tatum not the criticism isn't warranted. It's absolutely, I mean, like you like especially in the Bucks series when he was averaging probably in the higher twenties points wise, like 
this, like you were kind of crowning him, especially after beating Giannis, after beating Kevin Durant, crowning him as like a superstar player. And I mean, for his first finals, he really he didn't like live up to I guess the expectations that people had. I mean, he averaged like twenty two and I think maybe seven and seven, but the efficiency was not there. There was a lot of turnovers. So he did. He does deserve criticism. Now I think this is mainly in, in today's day and age, especially on like Twitter. Like if you don't succeed immediately out, out of the get go, people are gonna just like say like I've seen a bunch of people say the Celtics need to now now the trade Jalen Brown and the trade Jason Tatum um, uh, talk is back, and I don't understand it. Another thing the Celtics like they, people have said the Celtics need a true point guard, but they yet to have said who a true point guard is. I, I don't I don't get it, but. No, I, I think the Celtics absolutely can be back. They are a very young team. I mean, this league is built on, like, two-way wings, and the Celtics have two of the best two-way wings in the entire league. Robert Williams, I mean, he's great when healthy, and that's the thing. He wasn't really healthy for this series. He got rushed back from a surgery like in, like, in the Nets series, and he's been playing kind of hurt the entire time. So he was just gassed. The entire team was gassed. They had played way too many games and you know, so many game sevens they're they i think i think they were just tired but i mean i got hope i got hope for the future i think they can be back but if they if they do come back jason tatum absolutely needs to play better same thing with jalen brown that's an interesting point brian and i agree that they have to play better if they want to win they got to get over that hump but we have to also look at that they were playing the warriors the warriors are arguably the best team right now the best team in basketball because of what they did on the past and also this year i uh you said that you did not um, or you thought the criticism was warranted, I'll go a little bit in the middle. You did kind of change my opinion a little bit because it doesn't make sense what you were saying. So maybe a little bit's warranted. But even so, I mean, like you said, it was his first NBA Finals. With a team like this, I think they will get back there. So he's just going to have to prove himself. He, he already works hard. He has a chip on his shoulder, right? He's going to have even more of a chip on his shoulder, you know, with that connection with Kobe. Um, he really wants to make Kobe proud, and I think he will be able to do that eventually. He'll get his chance later on. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Um, I don't think they should trade anybody. I think the team is fine. As you said, the, the makeup and, and um, having those young players, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, even Al Hortford, who is not a young player, but he I want to talk about him earlier. He played fantastic throughout the entire series. If he could do that just into next year, I mean, that'd be such a, a big addition um, to that offense. But nevertheless, we have to move on because we have other things to talk about, even though I know, Brian, you'd want to talk about your Celtics forever. Uh, and we, we probably could, uh, honestly. But well, I'm going to move on over to the Warriors. Um, they are now, as we mentioned, a bona fide dynasty. So I have some questions about a players or coach on the Warriors. So Steve Kerr, does he, do you guys think he has one of the best careers as both a player and a coach in all of basketball? And also, I, in my opinion, a little bit easier one, uh, Steph, is he the greatest shooter of all time? Answer one, answer, answer both. It is up to you. Brian, I will start with you. All right. So, I mean, I'll start with the Steph one. Yes. All right, so I'll move on to the Steve Kerr one now. There's only one. You only need to say one word. Yes, there's no way he's not. Anyway. That's the right answer. That is the correct <laughs> That's answer. That's the only That's answer. It's the only good. answer. I'm happy you said that. Only answer. So as for Steve Kerr, he's had one of the, in terms of, it, this is strange, because, like, he's had a great career because he's won so many rings. But, like, as of, I mean, as a player, he, he had his moments, obviously, on the Bulls. But, like, he, it's not like he was some terrific, like all-star, all NBA caliber player who then transitioned into coaching. Like maybe we'll see Chris Paul do or something whenever he retires. But in terms of the amount of rings he's won, I mean, yeah, it's hard to say that he's had a like a uh, yeah, he's had like anything above anything below like an incredible career. I feel like he doesn't get some of the coaching he, uh, coaching credit he deserves because I mean, yeah, he has Stephen Clay and now Jordan Poole is kind of emerging as like this third piece that they need. But he's still he, he's still a, a a really really talented coach. He was able to game plan for the Celtics offense pretty well. Obviously, as you saw a lot. They Celtics turned the ball over all the time. So I feel like he's kind of an almost like an underrated coach. But as for um, uh, I mean, as a player, I don't think he had the. I mean, he had, I don't know. I, I'm thinking of like in terms of like all stars and all NBA. And he won a bunch of. He's like he had the playing career of like Robert Ory, just not as much. And well, he uh, he had like, yeah playing career of Robert Ory, but he's had a great coaching career. So he's obviously a much better coach than he is a player. So I have to completely agree with Brian on this. Yes and yes. Regarding Steph, he definitely is, in my opinion, the greatest shooter of all time. And you can make the argument that he is the most influential player of all time. Definitely one of them with how the style of play in the NBA has shifted so much. And talking about Steve Kerr, it's pretty funny, Brian. You mentioned Robert Ory. 
I have in my notes, Steve Kerr, to me, has the most legendary resume as a role player alongside Robert Ori. As a coach, I mean, he is underrated. I feel like people don't talk about him enough, in my opinion. I know that sounds like a crazy thing to say about the, someone who's coaching the Warriors, but having all the talent that he has is one thing, but being able to take that talent and turn it into a dynasty like he has is a very special thing to me. Okay, I'm happy we are all on the same page about Steph Curry because I would have a problem if we were not. I I used to think it was Reggie Miller, despite being a Knicks fan. Reggie Miller kind of gives me bad memories, but oh. it, it's whatever. You had, so you had Reggie over Ray at first. Well, that was, I mean, this was like a few years ago before Steph, you know, that, was like that, that's not no, that, that doesn't matter. I don't care if it's a few years ago. You had Reggie over Ray Allen. Yes, yeah. Why? Yeah. Real quick, uh, why? Okay, well, that, that's for a different show. Okay, we'll, okay, we'll talk about that okay, for, fair We'll make sure we touch on it. This is a special show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a PTV special, specialty shows. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> Steph Curry uh, has now surpassed um, Reggie Miller now, in, in my opinion. You know, I think just based on the, the eye test, like if you just watch him play, Every single game, it seems like he hits a shot that's like, how did that go in? And then you look at the stats afterward, and he backs it up, too. I mean, he has so many statistics. Uh, he has the most made three-pointers of all time, the highest free throw percentage, the highest three-point percentage in a, in the um, in the NBA Finals. Like, so many crazy stats that probably will never be broken. And also, Bobby brought up a good point about uh, being influential. I didn't really think of that, but you're right, because it has absolutely changed the game of basketball. The three-point shot now is a must-have. You, you need to have players on our team – who are able to shoot the three if you want to be able to win championships, which is not really like that, just even 10 years ago, um, which isn't really that far removed. And also, if you look about look at uh, new kids and the new generation of talent, the three-point shot is being practiced more and more amongst younger players uh, and younger generations coming up through the, you know, through the ranks, through college, and then eventually into the NBA. So you're absolutely right about Steph Curry being a very influential player. And yes, I do think that he is the greatest shooter of all time. Now, talking about Steve Kerr for a little bit, I also agree he was never like a, a, a you know, an all-star or like the, the best player on his team at every given, any given point. But he was able to be a role player and play that role extremely well. And I think that's why he was able to help his team, the various teams that he was on, win multiple championships. He won three with the Bulls, two with the Spurs. And then he also has now won four with the Warriors. So I absolutely do think that Steve Kerr's resume is up there with the greats of both players and coaches in the entirety of the NBA. But now we're going to move over to baseball, and boy, is it a good time to be a baseball fan of a team that plays in New York, because wow, the Mets and the Yankees are both phenomenal right now. Um, I can't talk enough about it. Um, I'm going to let you guys have the floor first before I go on my rant. So, Bobby, we'll start with you. What are your thoughts thus far You know, on the, the, the Mets and the Yankees positions so far? I, I can't believe it, honestly. I mean, the Yankees, I mean, they're a juggernaut this year. They finally put all the pieces together, I feel. I mean, Aaron Judge is crazy watching him. Garrett Cole, when he's hot, he is hot. They have pitchers like Jamison Tyone flirting with perfect games through seven. I mean, it's insane. The bullpen, I mean, Clay Holmes bringing down his ERA from 2019 by like four whole runs. That's crazy. Nestor Cortez coming out of the woodworks to be one of the best pitchers in baseball. I mean, they were fun to watch. And not and now moving over to the Mets, I mean, my personal favorite team. What they've done this year as like a comparison to the last five or six seasons is phenomenal. It is so much fun watching baseball again, uh, even without DeGrom and Scherzer at the moment. I mean, Tyler McGill had a great start of the season. Drew Smith has been phenomenal out of the bullpen. Edwin Diaz is finally back to his Mariner self as an elite reliever in the National League. Jeff McNeil is back. He finally is for contact again. He's electric. Luis Guillorme, too. Pete Alonso being an NL MVP candidate. If it wasn't for Paul Goldschmidt, obviously. I mean, I can go on and on for ages about New York baseball, but I'll let Brian give his thoughts. No, I mean, I, I feel like I don't really have a whole lot to add here. Both of these teams, I don't know how long it's been since we see, like, both New York teams, like, play at this level. And I feel like, in, really with all the New York sports, it's always one team is better than the, uh, better than the rest, or they're both kind of equally bad, how we see right now with, like, the Giants and Jets. Neither team is, like, at that peak. But right now... Both New York baseball teams have maybe not peaked because I don't want to say they can because they can only get better from here. But I mean, both like, the Yankees have 52 wins in their first in their division. I haven't checked them the uh, the Mets record, but I'm assuming it's like right up there in the first with their division too. Everyone on those teams is playing out of their mind right now, and yeah, like Bobby said, baseball is fun to watch now. 
I absolutely agree. I think New York is buzzing right now. I mean, the New York media is loving it with both teams in the state being extremely, extremely good. And just watching the Yankees play, it's really a treat because two games in a row, they were down four plus runs and they came back and were able to win. I think last night was the night where they had a six run ninth inning and they came back and win. And then the, the last game against the Rays, they were down four, and they slowly clawed their way back. Aaron Judge had two home runs in that game. They finally ended up winning 5-4. And it's like this team is never out of things. Like whenever, Regardless of the score, the Yankees hitting and the Yankees lineup is good enough to keep them in games with whatever happens. And then over on the Mets side, the Mets have 45-plus wins without their three best pitchers. As you talked about, Bobby, um, Siler Miguel started fantastic. He got hurt. Of course, Jacob DeGrom was shut down before the season even started. And now Scherzer isn't playing as well. But they're, Jacob DeGrom and Max Scherzer are both on their way back. Hopefully they can get in the uh, lineup or the pitching rotation as soon as possible. But the Mets are still being extremely successful without those three key players which I was a bit surprised. I didn't know how they would do. I mean, losing more than 50% of your starting rotation is never ideal for a baseball team, but the Mets have been able to fight adversity. They've been able to hit, as you said, um, Francisco Lindor having a much better season than last year. Pete Alonso being potentially the NL MVP. He was leading the NL in home runs, and then um, he was overtaken by one home run. Uh, everybody, at one point, Luis Guillaume was batting 21 for his last 40, which is absolutely phenomenal not to mention he's a utility player he's not even a guy that plays every day for this Mets team so they're getting that kind of production from a player who is uh, who is you know playing all around he's not really a traditional starter for this Mets team you can tell how excited I am how fast I'm talking about this Mets team so that's just a little indication of how I feel about them um, but we're going to move on a little bit so with the Yankees and the Mets leading their respective division in wins uh, which player would you say has been really the the key point or a pivotal point uh, the driving force behind success. All right, I'll take this one first. Um, so I'll take the MLS. I know Bobby's going to take the Mets, understandably so. So I'll take the Yankees. Uh, we all knew that Aaron Judge was going to kind of do his thing, right? I mean, he has like high 20s home runs, over 50 RBI and runs, and he's batting like 300 at this point in the season. But we all kind of, if we know he's a great player, we all knew that he was going to do that. And Garrett Cole, like you said, when he's hot, he's hot. But we knew that going in. We knew who Garrett Cole was. I feel like the kind of maybe most surprising player, at least for the Yankees, I'm going to go with Nestor, Nestor Cortez. I don't think any of us saw him being as good as he was, like at least in this point in the season. He's like, and he's 6-3 and three is win-loss. 2.3 ERA with a .96 whip, which is, I mean, like an under one whip is pretty good. And he's been huge for this Yankees rotation when Garrett Cole has taken a little bit of extra time to kind of get into his groove. All right, so for the Mets, I was really racking my brain last night trying to think of just one player in particular. I mean, there are at least four candidates in my mind. When we're talking about the Mets' success as of late, you have to mention Peter Morgan Alonso. He's been phenomenal so far. If it wasn't for Paul Goldschmidt playing out of his mind the last two weeks, Pete Alonso, without a doubt, would be the best first baseman in baseball. There's some stats for you. Until Kyle Schwarber's night last night, Pete Alonso led the league, well, the National League, with 20 home runs. An MLB best 66 runs batted in before the start of July. He has an OPS plus of 158. The average is 100. I mean, I can go on about what that stat means. Then his wins above replacement as of now is 1.8. The other mentions I wanted to say very quickly were Jeff McNeil. His batting average is 327. He's returning to that contact hitting form he had when he was an all star in 2019. His OPS plus is 143. He has so much hustle. He's got that dog in him, that, as, as I always see all over Twitter. I'm finally saying that on a recording. And Edwin Diaz is returning to form as well. He has 17.6 Ks per nine, and his, walk to, his strikeout to walk ratio for every one walk, he has almost five strikeouts. I mean, just look, looking at that save against uh, the Angels. The other week or, or a week or so ago on uh, Sunday Night Baseball, that was electric. I mean, right now, those are the three. And even Lindor with his series against the Marlins last week. I mean, I can go on and on. But uh, if I just pick just one, definitely Alonzo. Absolutely. Pete Alonzo has been playing phenomenally. Uh, 20, like you said, 20 home runs. And Ed Luz Diaz is now Edwin Diaz. Thankfully, we can stop calling him Ed Luz Diaz because he's not losing anymore. Knock on wood. But he's doing really well. Um, but I'm going to go a little bit of a different route. I know I told you guys in the rundown to pick players, but I'm going to pick a manager, and it's going to be the Mets manager. Buck Showalter, I think, has been such a positive influence on this baseball team. We're talking about a guy who everybody likes. He has he has the notion of being, you know, hardhead and you know, hard on his players, but he really just loves baseball, wants to talk about baseball 24-7, um, and is all about 
getting his players better. Uh, and not to mention, he will go to bat for his players. The Mets have had problems with getting hit by pitches for the entire season. And every time, Buck Showalter looked like he's going to go out and beat somebody up because of it. So, Buck Showalter has these players back. I think it's it's a really good culture change compared to last year. It's a complete 180, really, when you think about it. Um, because uh, Rojas is definitely not the caliber that uh, Buck Showalter was, or is. Um, and so I think it's for the Mets, I, I would say, I would say definitely Buck Showalter ha- has been such a, you know, a, a big part of this team succeeding. And, and even though he doesn't, you know, put on the, well, he does put on the uniform technically, but he doesn't step in the batter's box and step in between those white lines. He is definitely a driving force of their success. Now, what I'm about to say might be a little bit preemptive, but are we gearing up for a 2000 rematch Yankees Mets world series? And if we are, who's going to win it? I'll take I'll take this one first. So I admittedly don't follow baseball maybe as closely as you two, but you know having the opportunity last semester to room uh, with my wonderful co-host here Bobby Steiner, he I think in March maybe he sat me down and had me watch like 20 minutes of like Mets blowing games. So and he's mentioned it time and time again. The Mets always have these great starts, and yet they seem to somehow fall apart in September. So I'm not trying to jinx anything, but if it does come to this World Series, uh, I don't see anything kind of changing. I don't know why that wouldn't happen this year as well. I'm sorry to say it, but, I mean, Bobby, with you, made me, you made me watch like a 10-minute video of Edwin Diaz blowing games in like the ninth inning. So <laughs> I, have to, I have to go with the Yankees here if it does come down to that World Series matchup. All right, so I will back up what Brian was saying. Around the end of spring training, I showed him Mets lowlights compilation. He's heard me rant for ages about 2007, 8, 2015, 2016, 2006 as well, Game 7 with Carlos Beltran. But uh, I do see, even though it's going to be terrible for my blood pressure and my heart, I do see a 2000 rematch. And with the Grom and Scherzer back when they're fully healthy, I will say this sounds a bit insane, a bit, you know, I'm just going on a limb, and I'd like to say this so I make myself happy. I can sleep at night saying this. I would say Mets in seven if they play the Yankees. I I think we're changing narratives here. I think the narrative is that the Mets will fold. The Mets don't have what it takes. The Mets always crumble towards the end. Uh, and has that happened in the past quite a bit? Yeah. However, I'm going to say it. I think this year is different, which is what we've been saying forever. However, the reason that I'm saying that is because the Mets are able to score runs without having the crazy caliber of pitching that they normally have. Usually, the Mets have a extremely good amount of pitching, and then the run support is simply not there, and the Mets lose games. However, this year, we haven't been able to see that. We've had The Mets have had three of the best pitchers uh, be injured, and yet the Mets are still finding ways to score runs. I'm with Bobby, Mets and Skevin, LGM. Let's go, Mets. Uh, okay. Uh, Before I uh, become any more of a homer, I think we're going to move on to the NHL. Now, in the NHL, we're having a really crazy series, honestly. The best two teams are currently battling out for superiority in search of the Stanley Cup. On one side, we have the Avalanche. Colorado Avalanche, they've only lost three games in the entire playoffs and currently sit atop a 3-1 lead against fierce opponents, the Tampa Bay Lightning. The Avalanche are currently looking to win their first Stanley Cup in the last 20-plus years. And on the other side, it's just a team that just won't go away. The Tampa Bay Lightning are on their verge of building a dynasty as they've won the last two Stanley Cups in a row. Now they are facing a 3-1 deficit on the other side of that, only having one win thus far. Uh, and they have been down on games previously. We saw in the, the conference finals against the Rangers, they were down, they were down two nothing, and they were able to win four straight and come back. So this team just keeps fighting, showing their resilience. Never count out Tampa Bay. But what an insane series that we've seen so far. What are your initial thoughts on these first four games that we've watched? So I'll start with this one. Um, I've been surprised, honestly. I mean, I, going into this, I knew these were the two best teams in the league playing. But Andre Vasilevsky, I mean, what has happened to him? He, besides Igor winning the Vesna, he, in my opinion, is the top goalie in the league, and he only has a .889 save percentage. I mean, losing games 7 nothing. I mean, I went into this knowing that Gabriel Landeskog, Nate McKinnon, and Kale McCarr were an unstoppable offensive juggernaut, but, like, I thought of it more as an immovable object versus an unstoppable force, but so far it's pretty much been avalanche series. They've been getting gritty overtime wins in that 7 nothing blowout, and then losing one by four, which is definitely not ideal if you're an avalanche fan, but... I mean, that, that is just crazy to me that Vasilevsky is playing the way he is for someone I'm used to that high caliber. And then on the other side for goalies, I mean, Kemper, the Tampa Bay Lightning offense is insane. I mean, as an Islander fan, I saw them overpower my beloved Islanders two years in a row, then just manhandle the Rangers this series in, in, in the way they did. 
But him stopping an offense like that is crazy, especially when someone like Nikita Kucherov. And then one last player I want to mention is Valeri Nichushkin, I believe you pronounce his last name. Games one and two having three goals in them. I mean, that's crazy playing a hero like that in hockey. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, every game this series just seems like almost, almost kind of like a flip of a coin. The Avalanche, they are up 3-1, but in two of those wins, like separated by one goal in overtime, or the game, or what, game one and game four were both one goal overtime wins for the Avalanche. But I think games two and three, that's the weirdest part of the series for me. Like, we have two really tight overtime games. They decide by one goal. And then in between those two games, we have a 7 nothing blowout and then a 6-2 blowout. I think those are kind of outliers for each team. I don't see kind of those kind of those kind of games continuing here in Game 5 or if it goes Game 6 or 7. So, I mean, I really I don't know what's going to happen tonight. These, Like you said, Bobby, these are by far these are the two, two best teams in the NHL. The series could end tonight, but I mean, I'm sure we'll discuss that later. Yeah, you're right, Brian. They match up really, really well. And it was that's why I said use the word crazy in the intro, because it's kind of a crazy series. Two games, as you said, really close. Two games, not so close. Did I expect it? No. I, I, I'm i not going to lie. I did underestimate the Avalanche, but the Avalanche are playing phenomenal. The Avalanche have looked like they've outpaced the Tampa Bay Lightning, and the Tampa Bay Lightning are a team that we've seen to be play extremely quick, uh, fast hockey. They are able to move the puck really, really well in the offensive zone. But we've seen the Avalanche defensively been able to hold Tampa Bay to not scoring too many goals. I mean, even in the loss that they had, well, in the loss that they had, the, the Tampa Bay did score six. But I mean, aside from that loss in the game that they've won, it hasn't really been Tampa Bay, you know, having scoring a bunch of goals as, as the most recent game was uh, two goals for Tampa Bay. And then in, in that blowout, it was seven, nothing. So they shut out Tampa Bay. So defensively, they've been able to hold this firepower offense that Tampa Bay has. And also offensively, man, they've looked great on power plays. Um, also even strength too. I, I'm not going to lie. I, I will say that I was wrong in underestimating just how much the avalanche are. I wasn't willing to write them off by any means, but I did not think that they would come out and play as well as they have been. So that those were my initial thoughts on the series, but there's still a burning question. Uh, will Tampa come back? Are they able to erase this deficit, win out in the series, and win the Stanley Cup, or will the Avs win it, perhaps even tonight at home? Well, I mean, in any sport, a three-one deficit is is super hard to come back from. I won't I, I won't say the series is going to absolutely end tonight. I think it might go to six games, but I do think that the Avalanche like, end their Stanley Cup drought. I, again, I think the Lightning maybe steal Game Five tonight, and then the, uh, and Colorado closes it out in Game Six. I know, Louis, you mentioned earlier that the like the uh, the Lightning they've been down before. I mean, they've never been down three one though. At least in this playoff run, they haven't. They've been down two one and three two to the Maple Leafs, but that's the Maple Leafs. And then you said they were down two nothing to the Rangers, but down. I don't think they haven't been down two games to a team of this caliber yet. So and their backs are against the wall, so they're gonna try whatever they can to steal a game, but I think the Avalanche close it out in six. I'm with Brian on this. They might not necessarily win tonight, but the Avalanche are definitely going to win at some point this week. I mean, a 3-1 lead in hockey is always kind of fragile. I mean, look at the the Penguins um, last month against the Rangers. That kind of uh, fell through for them, but definitely I have the Avalanche in six. Well, I'm going to go against what you guys have said, and I'm still going to take Tampa Bay. I thought that they would win coming into the series, and then now four games into the series, I'm going to stick with my pick. I mean, I, I think Tampa Bay's resiliency is bar none. I think that if there is a team to come back from 3-1, it is absolutely the Tampa Bay Lightning. They want that 3 P. It's, it's kind of weird because they don't have the hunger as, as the Avalanche do, I would argue, because the Avalanche, you know, basically there are no players in the Avalanche that have any Stanley Cup playoff experience, let alone a Stanley Cup win. Now you look over at Tampa Bay, there's a bunch of players that have two Stanley Cups. So I think the hunger is, is there for the Avalanche, but the the ability of, of uh, resiliency and, and you know, the, the, the fight and that just will to win of Tampa Bay's side, I think it could very well could power them into winning these next three games. And boy, what a series that would be. But uh, Brian mentioned um, about how Tampa Bay has not been down to a team of this caliber. And you're absolutely right. They also were not down two games this late in a series. So I guess we'll just have to see how it plays out. But as for right now, I think I will be sticking with my original pick in Tampa Bay, doing the improbable, coming back and finding, finding a way to win in game seven in 
but Colorado, which would be obviously away from home from Tampa Bay. Crazy scenes if that would ever to occur, but I guess we'll just have to watch tonight and see what happens. So that will do it for the second installment of Hall Pro presented by PTV. I don't know about you guys, but I had a fantastic time getting back in here talking about professional sports. For Bobby Steiner and for Brian Henderson, I am Louis Pasquale. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you next time.